the, so when I walked into the room, I said, well, what better way to tempt longevity than to stand right in front of the Grim Reaper and have him over my back the whole entire time? So we'll, we'll see if I make it to the end of the talk here. But uh, I, want to, uh, I want to thank the Coggenshock Valley Educational Fund and Mary Elizabeth for calling me up and asking me to come here and speak with you all tonight. It's a real pleasure. Um, and I want to thank you guys for listening. Um, so I've had the opportunity to talk about this topic um, a number of times over the last year and a half. And usually it's about three hours. Um, so you guys can kind of settle in. Um, no, I was able to get it down to an hour and 45 minutes, so we should, we should be good. So I'm going to tell this kind of as a story, which is a little bit different than how I usually would talk about this topic. But uh, this is really my story of my journey with the Blue Zones Project. Um, and, and I hope it's an interesting story for you guys. All right, the journey begins. And I, and, you know, I do have pictures, and almost all of them will include my children, because when you give a talk, that's what you get to do, right? So my journey begins. So really, you know, I, I'm a family physician, um, certainly not one of the top 10. I'm just, just a decent family physician. But um, uh, I was in office practice and treating my patients, and I think many of us realize over time the frustrations, which is uh, our patients are not getting the outcomes that we want them to. And, and most often, this is not because of lack of knowledge. This is not because of lack of willpower. This is not because of not wanting to do the right thing. There's, there's other challenges and forces at work. So, so anyone who is in healthcare, we see this time and time and time again. And I think we often wonder why that is the case. Um, there's two statistics, kind of public health statistics, that, that really always resonate with me. So I wanted to share those with you today. When you look at the United States of America and you look at how much we spend on health care per person, we spend by far and large more money uh, on health care per individual than any country in, in the world. And it's about $9,000 per person per year. And when you look at that, that's not even close. I think that's about four or $5,000 per person higher than the, than the next closest country, which is not entirely a bad thing. We've got lots of technologies, they're expensive. You know, we can argue back and forth about this. In my mind, if we were getting exceptional outcomes, that money would be justified. But the next part of this, this statistic is you look at, for developed countries, and you compare the United States to the top 11 other developed similar countries in the world, we rank 11th out of 11. So, so that's kind of shocking. So that tells us we're spending tons and tons of money and we're getting suboptimal outcomes. So there's something going on there. Um, the other statistic that, that really resonates with me, not only as a doctor, but as, as a parent of two sons, is this generation is currently anticipated to be the first generation with a shorter life expectancy than their parents. Um, and this is the first time in about two to three hundred years that this has actually happened statistically. So that's, that's kind of sad, right? That makes me feel as a parent like maybe I'm doing something or we're doing something as a society that's not giving our, our kids a chance for a better life. Um, and, uh, and when I really kind of mold, mold that over and think about why is that the case, um, it's not because we're not trying, and it's not because we don't have a, a, a workforce in healthcare that is well-intentioned and is trying to utilize all of their resources and skills, and it's not because the patients don't care and don't want to do well. Um, it's because we've got an environment, a health environment, um, that makes things exceedingly difficult. Um, so this is a concept that really started to kind of percolate and resonate with me as I, as I kind of went through my years of, of practice. Um, so what did I do about that? I, I, I said, well, let me start reading and just learning and learning about different models of health and different concepts. Um, and, and somewhat spontaneously, um, I decided to pick up a book about the Blue Zones. And I think um, I was probably somewhat familiar with the Blue Zones as a concept from the National Geographic cover. Um, maybe many of you have seen, let's see. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, this sort of National Geographic cover from, from the past. So it kind of percolated in my mind. I said, okay, let me, let me read some about the Blue Zones and find out. Um, and the more and more I read about this concept of health, um, it really resonated with me. And it really, there was a number of things that I found to be factual, that I found to be common sense, um, and, and I found to be a good idea. So I'd like to share some of those concepts with you. Um, so briefly, Blue Zones, the only reason they're referred to as Blue Zones is about 15 years ago, a, a team was assembled, and, and their mission or their goal was to try to find hot spots in the world 
that were exceptional in regards to longevity, in regards to wellness, so having a low chronic disease burden, and really in regards to uh, independence and high functioning. So, so for me, I don't know if I'm gonna live a long life, depends on this guy right here, but I would like to be as independent, as functional, and have the highest quality of life for as many years as I can. Um, so these five locations were identified as hotspots that were exceptional in, in those natures. Um, and this was a, a kind of a multidisciplinary specialty team. So uh, Dan Butner was the author of these, of these studies. Um, but it was demographers, it was nutritional specialists, it was healthcare specialists. So really a team of 10 to 15 different specialists surveying the world looking for these hotspots. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about each of them. So the first was in Okinawa, Japan, uh, which I think kind of makes sense. We're familiar with Okinawa as an area for longevity. So females in Okinawa are the longest lived population in the world. And many of them are living well into their hundreds and, uh, and are highly functional and independent into their early hundreds. The Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, which um, I'm actually happy is one of the, the one blue zone I've been able to visit myself. This is on the northwestern Pacific coast of Costa Rica um, and has the world's lowest rate of middle age mortality and uh, a high rate of male centenarians, men who are living past 100. Sardinia, Italy, which is a kind of an island off the coast of Italy and has the world's highest concentration of male centenarians. Icaria, Greece, which is a very mountainous uh, island uh, in the Aegean Sea off of Greece. Um, the lowest rates of middle age mortality and lowest rates of dementia in the world. And then interestingly, in the United States, Loma Linda, California. Um, so Loma Linda, the thing that's exceptional is they have a very high concentration of Seventh-day Adventists. So it's a specific faith that uh, puts a lot, of, um, a lot of focus on lifestyle and nutrition um, and has a very close-knit community. And in Loma Linda, on average, these folks live 10 years longer than their North American counterparts. So that's, that's pretty exceptional. Um, so they spent a number of years studying all of the variables as to what was going on. What was it about? Was it genetics? Was it, uh, was it environment? Was it lifestyle? And, and looking and really trying to boil down and statistically analyze what are the things that are factoring, in, factoring into exceptional health and longevity in these communities. Um, and they were able to consolidate it down to nine common lifestyle variables. And I just want to talk briefly about these because they kind of serve as a foundation as to where we're going. So number one, moving naturally. We think about, um, we think about our society here in America, and these are all generalizations, of course, but um, we've really engineered activity out of our lives. We live a life of convenience. Most of us have the ability to either drive to where we need to go or take public transportation. We're not walking on a daily basis. We're leading mostly sedentary jobs. We're not doing the same degree of physical activity as we would. Um, these countries found ways throughout their day, nonstop, to be moving naturally. So they probably, every 20 minutes, had some sort of physical activity. Um, the right outlook, so very significant. Um, and I don't think we do a good job at quantifying or measuring this in, in healthcare, but knowing your purpose, waking up in the morning with a sense of why are you alive? What's your mission? What's your purpose? That was very, very protective. Um, the concept of downshifting. So this is finding ways to relax uh, later in the day. And that might be uh, meditation. That might be yoga. That might be taking time to honor your, uh, your, your loved ones. Uh, in Japan, they did a lot of focus on, uh, on ancestors. Um, or that may be my favorite downshift, which is napping. Um, so I'm actively trying to embrace that. My wife, Becky, is actively trying to stamp out my napping. I'm persisting for my health and longevity. So. Um, eating wisely, and, and really, in my mind, the quality of our nutrition and what we're eating and how we're eating is the number one most important variable in terms of our long-term health and, and our, and our long-term uh, outcomes. So the vast majority of what uh, folks in the blue zones were eating was plant-based. Uh, about 95% of their diet was fresh fruits and vegetables, but then also nuts, legumes, lentils, whole grains. We kind of have developed this carbophobic society, um, but they eat lots and lots of carbs, but they're healthy, natural carbohydrates. Um, so about 95% plant-based diet. The 80% rule I always find interesting, um, and it's basically stop eating when you're 80% full. 
Um, some people are really good at this. I'm lousy at this because I know when I'm 120% <laughs> right? But it's really hard to know when you're 80% full. But I think the concept to this is finding ways to eat mindfully and eat slowly, number one, so that you are um, taking in less calories over the course of the day, which, you know, which factors into your long-term weight. Um, but then more importantly, you're actively kind of chewing and enjoying your food and savoring your food. And we know biochemically, sometimes the longer you're chewing food, that changes the composition of what's getting into your GI tract, and that changes your nutrition. Um, you know, what I think is probably the most controversial out of the nine is, is wine at five. And the, and the truth is that almost all of these uh, communities had one to two glasses of wine most days of the week. Um, and, and alcohol is very, very controversial in healthcare. Um, you know, we know that there are lots of negative effects that too much alcohol can have. And we know that there are quantifiable positive effects that small amounts of alcohol can have, specifically on the cardiovascular system. Um, so certainly this is not recommending if you've got a, a history of, of addiction or, or alcohol difficulties or if you've got liver problem. Wine obviously isn't going to be a good idea, but these communities typically uh, would drink one to two glasses of wine, um, and that was always with friends and always with a meal. Um, so that was a component of this. And then the long. So family first. These communities would find ways to keep their families close, um, not only to nurture their children, um, but also to keep their aging elderly um, under their care um, and not putting them in nursing homes. Um, and, and that was very, very protective, uh, both for the older generations as well as positive influence on the younger generations. Um, belong, so the vast majority of these folks belong to some element of a faith-based community. It did not matter specifically what religion or faith or belief system that was, but they would participate on average four times a month. Um, and then the last one is the right tribe, which is really the concept of who are the people surrounding you? Who are your closest friends, your closest family members, the people you're interacting with on a regular basis, and what are their health habits? Um, so, if uh, statistically, if your three closest friends all smoke cigarettes, the likelihood of you smoking cigarettes is exceptionally high, and it's exceptionally hard to quit if you do smoke. Um, if your three closest friends are, you know, plant-based and they're, uh, you know, running on a regular basis, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to be doing that more, more than average. So, who is your right tribe? Um, okay. So, those are the nine common lifestyle variables. So what was really, really interesting, and this is the part that, that I love the most about the Blue Zones concept, is that when you interviewed these folks in their 90s and 100s and said, you know, how did this happen? What you found out is that absolutely none of them were actively out there trying to do things to live a long life. They were not going on diets. They were not going to the gym. They were not exercising in the sense of, I need to wake up and exercise. They were not taking supplements. What they were doing is they were waking up and living and functioning in the natural confines of, of their environment and their community and their culture. And the real power, in my mind, of the Blue Zones concept is that it is the structure of those environments and those cultures and those communities that drove the positive health, uh, the positive lifestyle and, and the positive outcomes. Um, and that, I think, is a really interesting concept. Um, so what they did after they studied these areas for many, many years, and then they came back and, and, and published a few books and published a number of studies, um, they said, let's try to see if we can make a change in the United States of America, and let's see if we can find an unhealthy location. And amazingly, shockingly, they had no trouble at all finding an unhealthy location in the United States. They found plenty of options. Um, and so they started a pilot study in a town called Albert Lee, Minnesota, which is in southern Minnesota. It's about 20,000 people, roughly. Um, and, uh, and they tried to implement a public health, a comp comprehensive public health SWAT team strategy to put in place a lot of the lessons they had learned from the Blue Zone. Um, and they did this structurally. They looked at uh, complete streets, uh, you know, how walkable and bikeable the, the locations were. Um, they looked at uh, nutrition. They looked at uh, access and affordability of plant-based nutrition. They looked at connections and community. They really tried to go down all of those nine variables. Um, and they had quite a bit of success. So they were able to get, I believe, I'm probably going to misquote the statistics, but it was about a 15% reduction in smoking rates over the course of three years in this community. 
um, and they were able to get a double digit decrease in obesity rates in this community over about three years, um, and a very significant increase in fresh produce consumption, and then also from a financial standpoint, they were able to achieve a significant reduction in healthcare expenditures for major employers. So they had some initial pilot success, um, and, and they really followed this concept of a life radius, which is, for most of us, um, we spend 90% of our lives in this kind of 10 to 15 mile radius around where we live. And I think unless you work far away, unless you're you know, commuting to Manhattan or flying across the country, that's, that's the case. So looking at how do we implement changes in our health environment in all of these different domains. So, so our built environment, our park, parks, trails, town centers, our restaurants and grocery stores, our schools and workplaces, and our home environment. How do we implement uh, changes that nudge us into making the right decision? And, and doing that by making the healthy decision the easier decision, or, or the path of least resistance. Um, so this is very interesting. They started here in Minnesota, um, and then little by little, they spread to multiple different locations around the country. Um, so they tackled a series of communities in Southern California. Uh, they tackled, uh, actually, the state of Iowa signed up and said, we want to become the healthiest state in the United States. You wouldn't think of Iowa as that. But they've got, I think, 20 separate communities, small towns, medium towns, big cities that are participating in this. Um, they've tackled Fort Worth, Texas, a large, large city. Um, they've tackled uh, multiple areas in the state of Oregon. Uh, the state of Hawaii, I was actually able to see some of Blue Zones in action when I was out in Hawaii earlier this year, um, and Wisconsin. Uh, so I saw this map, and this was maybe about a year and a half ago, and I said, wow, that's really exciting. There's something going on here. There's a movement that's developing. But then I was immediately drawn to this large area of the country, you know, where we live, and there's nothing going on there, right? So, so why is that? So then I came up with this idea to say, well, why can't we make Connecticut a blue zone, right? Let's, let's see if we can explore this and, and see if we can make this happen. So that's been a lot of what I've been working on over the last year and a half was trying to say, is this something that we could actually uh, bring to reality? So I had talked about Dan Buettner, the author of the, of the Blue Zones books. This is his brother, Tony Buettner. Um, who uh, I've developed a relationship over time with, and uh, I had reached out to the organization to say, look, I live in this beautiful, beautiful place, Middlesex County, Connecticut, and here are all the reasons why we would be exceptional for your next Blue Zone Project site. I sent an email, didn't hear anything back. All right, so then I leaned in, right? Sent another email, and then amazingly, I heard back from, from Tony, and he said, Mike, let's start exploring this idea. So we had a series of phone conversations, and then I said, Tony, I'm gonna to bring you out to Middletown, we're gonna give this presentation, and we're gonna test this concept of, is our community amenable to this sort of idea? Um, so that developed over the course of a number of months. And then, um, there we go. So then we gave a presentation. Um, so Middletown High School, um, where my mom worked for 30 something years, uh, we brought him in, flew him in from Minnesota, we gave a presentation to a few hundred people, we talked about all of the concepts of, of the Blue Zones uh, studies and the Blue Zones projects. Um, and then at the end of that, we kind of paused and I held my breath and, and we polled everybody in the audience. We gave them surveys to fill out. And when I tallied the data, um, not about 95, greater than 95% of the participants felt that we should pursue this as a public health concept for our community. So I was, I was a little bit shocked to see that it was that strong, um, but I said, we, we need to keep going further with this. Um, this is just a picture, so, so I've got two elderly grandmothers that are living, they both live here in Middlefield. Uh, this is Sophie here with the white hair, this is my son Joey with the brown hair here, and uh, Sophie is 94, and she cranks out about a mile on her treadmill every day, and she actually does stop eating when she's 80% full and tells me about it every single meal. Uh, <laughs> but I thought that th this was kind of, this is when we were getting ready before the presentation, I thought this was neat because she's sitting there telling my, my younger son, the, the science and the secrets of living longer. <laughs> Let's see. All right, so then, so then after the presentation, things were kind of fast and furious there for a number of months. And, and to be honest with you, it was, it was really exciting and a little overwhelming, and I didn't really know what to do with it, but lots of doors were opening. Um, so I spent um, the next four months 
trying to talk to everybody that I could about this concept and trying to gauge, do we have not only the community willpower, but the financial willpower to try to pursue this sort of a project. So um, I had a number of conversations with Middlesex Hospital, Community Health Center, pro-health physicians, um, reached out to the state of Connecticut, Department of Public Health, um, kind of tried to beat down the door of all the major health insurers because clearly health insurance companies are probably the number one organization that stands to benefit financially from this sort of a concept. Um, had, had some inroads. I was really optimistic for a period of time. Uh, Wesleyan University invited me to give some lectures, spoke with a lot of the major businesses, the town leaders, the community foundations, really trying to see do we have a path to try to make this happen. Um, and, and like I said, for, for a good stretch of time, I had a lot of optimism, but unfortunately, everyone loves the idea until you ask for money. And I think that that's no big surprise. And, and the truth is, these projects, you know, they do have a cost associated with them. And, uh, and by, by winter of 2017 into 2018, it was becoming very clear that a lot of these doors were now closing. So that was tough. Right? So I, uh, I, I, that was tough for a number of reasons. Um, and one, because a, you know, a number of you in this room were on board and very supportive and, and, and helping me and urging me and, and encouraging me to move forward with this. So I felt like I had really let the community down when this didn't come together. So I think that, you know, that, was, that was really kind of a tough pill to swallow. Um, and for a while, I felt like the sun was indeed setting on the project. This is a beautiful sunset, actually at the Durham Fair from the, uh, what was it, from the Demolition Derby last year. I don't know if anyone was there. But, but, it, but it was amazing. So, right, so it, we kind of had our Demolition Derby with the blue zone and the sun was setting. Um, so, so that was kind of a, a challenge. Um, and I had to kind of come to, come to accept, okay, maybe this, is, maybe this crazy idea is not going to launch the way, the way that I thought it would. So over time, the sun rose again, and, uh, and I realized I needed to shift my focus. Um, and, and I think that this was a really positive thing. So um, what I started to do uh, in the springtime was realize, OK, maybe we don't have the collective financial will and community will to make this happen right now in this region. Um, but the, the beautiful thing about this exploration is I've met many, many people who are doing tremendous work in a lot of these fields, unfortunately working in separate silos and, and often you know, we're not able to share our ideas and share, share our participation. Um, so I said, how can I shift the focus to identifying, supporting um, the organizations that are starting to create the, these sort of pillars of health? Um, and then the areas where the work is not happening, how do I come up with ideas? And, and how do I kind of rally the troops to make things happen? So, um, and the truth is, there's a lot of phenomenal stuff that's happening in our communities. So I want to share a little bit of that with you. So if we kind of go by those nine lifestyle variables, we talk about moving naturally. Um, how do we encourage people to move? So for the last three years, some of you may know, I've been running this Walk with a Doc program, uh, initially down at Peckham Park. And then what's really exciting is this year we've launched it down at Harbor Park in Middletown, and I work with the family medicine residents and, and get the, the doctors in training engaged in lifestyle um, and supporting the community. So this has been a, a good experience, although this is my niece, Gracie, and I must have been lecturing on something because she's fast asleep. <laughs> I don't blame her. This is just you know one of the one of the talks that we were giving at a walk with the talk event. I, you know I have to highlight the the go far uh, experience, which has been what maybe ten years, ten you know close to ten years here in our communities, and and really when I think about this as a public health strategy and a way to motivate our kids, this is a phenomenal phenomenal program, and I think we all need to realize how lucky we are to have this in our towns um, and continue to support that. Um, so I wanted to highlight that. Um, I did want to talk very briefly, complete streets. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this concept of complete streets, which is designing our, our towns and cities so that they're more walkable and bikeable. Um, Durham has a very active complete streets program that I've been able to meet with on a, on a few occasions, and, and they're making some really good headway. Middletown has this phenomenal, you can go online and find their, their long-term plan, this phenomenal vision and plan to interconnect not only all of the neighborhoods of Middletown, but getting, getting walking paths, extending the airline trail over the Portland Bridge, bringing that down into Durham, into Middlefield. Um, and these are initiatives that we need to support because they really could take us 
you know, quite a, quite a large step to, to what we're envisioning. Um, Plant-based uh, eating. So this is my son, Joey. He uh, decided he wanted a Meyer lemon tree, so he successfully grew some lemons. Um, there's a lot going on with plant-based eating in this community, and, and, and we're really quite lucky. So not only do we have you know, a tremendous number of community farms, this concept of CSA, or Community Supported Agriculture, we've got farmers markets. Um, recently in Middletown, they developed a, a Middletown Food Policy Council, and uh, I'm, I'm lucky to serve on that, and we're really analyzing what is the health and nutrition of food access in the city of Middletown, and then we'll be making policy recommendations to the city, and hopefully they'll listen to us. We'll see. Um, I was also lucky last month to be in Strong, and, and I was invited to teach nutrition to the eighth graders, and they were phenomenal. And, and they, they not only know so much, but they really were able to kind of digest the information and, and make it relatable. Um, and I think we need to be doing a lot more teaching nutrition with our kids. All right, so downshifting. I just wanted to highlight my good friend Nancy here, who doesn't like to be embarrassed, but she, she is a trained, uh, not only an amazing family therapist, but a, a trained yoga instructor, and she's been leading community events. So she had a, a yoga in the park at Peckham, uh, was it Peckham or Allenbrook? Allenbrook Park. Um, and then she has been offering, um, offering free yoga classes to teenagers in our district. Um, these are Thursday evenings, and, uh, and the teenage response has been amazing. And, and our kids, who we know, are exceptionally stressed and, and are suffering from higher rates of anxiety than in the past, um, are really, really kind of chomping at the bit for learning these skills to decrease their stress. So thank you, Nancy. Oh, this is my son, David, relaxing. <laughs> Doesn't he look relaxed? <laughs> um, this is really exciting, and I know a number of you in the room are involved in this. Um, the Giving Garden. So as you drive up and down um, Jackson Hill there, you see all the piles of dirt, and uh, I've had many people ask me who, who we're burying out there. And, <laughs> and I'm not gonna say, but, uh, but so this is, the, the plan is this spring to start growing the first crop of, uh, of vegetables. Um, and those vegetables will be going to the Durham and Middlefield food banks and helping those that can't afford to have fresh produce. Um, but it's about so much more than that because I think that this is gonna be a phenomenal opportunity for us to interact, for us to talk with each other, for us to connect, and for us to promote community. So this is another exciting project just down the road. Um, I wanted to highlight the Durham Middlefield Local Wellness Coalition, which is an organization I've been lucky to, to work with. Um, amazingly, this was uh, just the other week, um, it was awarded the top um, wellness coalition in the state of Connecticut. So we have this as a resource. Um, and, and amazingly, yeah, amazingly, you know, we, we've got this dedicated staff of people, which is you know, much more than the folks just here in this picture, um, but they're working not only on drug and alcohol prevention, but really comprehensively looking at our communities as to how can we implement health and wellness um, and, and bring the community together. Um, so that's, that's really important. Almost done. Oh, that's almost done. Family first. Um, this, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a, a policy, I don't have a, an initiative yet, but um, I just wanted to highlight, these are my two elderly grandmothers, Sophie and Evelyn. Sophie's 94, Evelyn's 92, on their birthdays, and we try really, really hard to make sure that we're there for every birthday, because you never know when, when, when it's gonna be the last birthday, but I think we need to be finding ways to keep our aging, family members home as much as possible. Um, and we not only need to be supporting them, but we need to be supporting the caregivers because very often the caregiver role is exceedingly difficult. Um, so I'm hopeful that maybe over time we can develop an initiative where we either provide additional support to caregivers or provide some sort of education around this topic. Faith-based communities. Um, what I would envision, um, we know that participation in, in churches uh, and other faith-based communities has declined quite a bit and probably is continuing to decline. Um, but when, what I envision is if we can find ways to celebrate our commonalities, and if we can find ways to have members of different faith-based communities working together on community health initiatives, I think there's a tremendous amount to gain there. So we'll see if we can get something going there. 
All right, and then wine. I've noticed, I've been observing, uh, I think you guys are all over this, right? Everyone's, <laughs> everyone's been enjoying a, a, a glass or five of wine with uh, friends and neighbors, um, so, so that's good. All right, so just a quick take-home message. I know I'm well over time to wrap it up. Um, what I want to impress upon you, the one take-home message, is knowing that your health, well-being, and your longevity are powerfully influenced by the environment surrounding you, the health environment and all that makes that up. However, we need to be empowered because we have a tremendous opportunity and potential to shape and improve our community's health environment and hopefully realize some of those long-term health benefits that come from that. So let's find ways to work together and uh, we'll see what we can get done. And thank you. concept of Mawai, which yeah. is multiple multiple members of a community committing to each other at a very early age and supporting each other throughout their entire lifetime through good times and bad. I don't know if that's what you're yeah, referring to. Exactly. Yeah, so Mawai is actually, that's a concept in Blue yeah. Zones. Um, and in applying that to the United States, they work on developing plant-based Mawais. Um, so I don't know that I had mentioned, but um, one of my colleagues in obstetrics, Dr. Ann Bingham, um, and Catherine O'Rourke, who's, who's a, 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 was a, a CCU nurse, um, they've actually developed this plant luck at CHC once a month, and um, everyone brings a plant-based meal. There's usually 40 to 50 people there, and you share each other's meals and talk about them and just kind of enjoy that community. So that's a, a plant-based Maui. And then really thinking about you know, activity and walking, in a sense, the Walk With a Doc program, we're, we've developed these little Mawais because I've got folks that come back on a regular basis. We get to know each other really well. We support each other. We ask what's going on in each other's lives. So yeah, it's a, it's a neat concept. It's beautiful, it's important. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Other questions? All right, thank you. <laughs>